and then we're and we're recording and um, welcome. I am really excited because I am here with um, Dr. Kathy Scaler Scott. Um, did, did I say that right? I, 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 I pronounced it once and called you Dr. Kathleen Scaler Scott. Um, I, I have a really good friend, um, Steve Scott. Um, uh, but uh, but anyway, um, I'm re I'm really excited for Dr. Um, Kathy Scaler Scott. Um, because she's uh, um, she's one of the major names in um, cluttering, and, and actually, I, I bought your um, book. Um, oh, um, I bought your book on uh, or, or um, the book that you co-edited. With David uh, and, Moore. Yeah. And um, and and Kathy has three books that you published, right? Correct. And about like seven hundred different um, technical articles on. I don't know about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I read your. Um, I read in my mind, Joseph, but I don't know if I have seven hundred in print. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I um, I pulled up your biography on my phone, and I was just like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and then I was like, oh, this is way too many articles. So, so, so I'm not sure exactly how many, but um, but you um, you published a whole bunch of, of stuff with it, and um, and you're you're also an active speech language pathologist too, right? Correct. Right. Cool. So, um, so, so anyway, that's my uh, that's my rough um, bi biography of you. Um, could you give a a um, a, a better or um, amended uh, amended biography? I mean, I think you did well with that. I I think um, I was a clinician for thirteen years, and then I went back to get my doctorate after thirteen years in clinical practice one of the major reasons was because I wanted to study cluttering and learn more about cluttering. Um, so then I went to school to get my doctorate so I could learn how to better do research. I knew a little bit about how to do research, but not in the proper way. So that's why I went to get my doctorate. And so now I teach, I do research, I supervise, and I see some clients on a limited basis. So I have like a well-rounded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's um, that's uh, that's something that I was gonna ask you. Is that um, do, do you have uh, like do you have like this time portal where you have like forty hours in the day, um, and where everyone else only has twenty-four, or or like what's your uh, what's your secret for being able to um, be a clinician, be a professor, be a uh, um, be a uh, uh, be someone that researches a lot um, and and everything um, and and everything else that you do. The true and, secret and, and, is and you're, you're, part, you're, you're part of the stuttering like National Stuttering Association too, right? I'm chair of the research committee. Yeah. Um, the the true secret is that um, I often feel overwhelmed and take on too much because everything sounds interesting. <laughs> So that's the secret. If you know a secret where I can get more hours in the day, I would love to know because I often look at other people and just am envious thinking, how do they get that done? How do they binge those series on Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So, um, so, so, so is your, your Netflix watching is, um, is limited to like an hour or so a week? It's limited, yeah, and it's usually multitasking. So maybe I should make that a New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So um, can you tell me about how, like, like what interested you in in cluttering, or, or or maybe like the question I should ask before is that how how did you first find out about cluttering? Because um, because probably when you started um, uh, um, probably when you started practice, then like I don't um, I don't know when. Um, in um, sorry, sorry uh, this is like my fourth question before I've let you answer. Uh, but but I guess my first question is when uh, when you went to school um, the first time, um, how much how much of the curriculum was about cluttering? How, like how much of, how much about cluttering did you learn about in school initially? Right, and the answer is zero. Like many, unfortunately, um, when I was in graduate school, I was very interested in stuttering. Um, but then I went to work at a school and I had one um, person who stuttered on my caseload. And then I had this little boy who I thought to myself, this isn't stuttering, but what is it? And so I did a little research and found an article on cluttering and realized, I think that's what he's doing. And I will tell you um, to show how fascinating it was to me, 
it was a special school. So when we had parent teacher conferences, all of the teachers from all the different subject areas would sit around in a circle and tell about, you know, whatever they taught. So um, they let me go first. And I started talking about, you know, that I think he has cluttering and this is what it is. And one of the teachers kindly looked at me and said, Ms. Scaler, um, I know you're really excited to tell about cluttering, but we need to move on to, you know, reading, math, other subjects. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first job. And then I never really dealt with it for probably another seven years or so until I started working in a private practice. And even then on a limited basis, but I was um, dealing with it a little bit more because I worked also in brain injury. So I didn't get much <laughs> exposure to cluttering there either. So, um, so then, um, so, uh, so, so, so that's just like um, two, um, two people that you talked about. Um, and then yeah. how did it go from, from exposure to two folks with cluttering to you saying, hey, well, this um, and, and actually, I, um, I think your uh, your first your first story is really cool, where you're just so excited that other people are, <laughs> other people are cutting you off and saying, "Hey, let's um, let's, talk about, let's talk let's talk about the more exciting um, topic of math." <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I guess in about 2000, I think I started working in a private practice setting, and then I was seeing more clients with fluency disorders, mostly stuttering, but I think there was some cluttering in there. And then that's when, like I had said to you, I really became more interested in that um, and uh, decided to go pursue my doctorate. And I went to study with John Tetnowski and he was kind enough to um, say, you can study whatever you want. So I said, I want to study cluttering for sure. And it just kind of blossomed from there. He let me study that. The next, I had been corresponding a little bit with Ken St. Louis. Um, and then we had a World Congress in Dublin. And you, I said to John Titanowski, I must meet Ken St. Louis. And then, you know, I had conversations with Ken. And then I think we had the World Congress in Bulgaria the following year. So it just kind of kept blossoming and blossoming. Cool, cool. So, um, and then, so, so your, your doctorate was in, your doctorate was in cluttering, is that right? Well, <laughs> to be honest, or, or, it kind of went in a few directions and that's kind of the way that I am. I've never really settled on one thing. I am probably the most passionate about cluttering, but also atypical disfluencies, like kids who repeat eat ends of words, erds. And I saw a lot of that in children with autism. So my dissertation actually just looked at general fluency in um, school-age children. It was a small sample. School-age children who stutter, school-age children who had no diagnosis in school age children with, um, at that time it was known as Asperger um, disorder. So I just looked to see like how much cluttering was there, how much stuttering was there in those three populations. Huh. And then um, what, did you, uh, what did you find with that? With the, um, with the population of autism spectrum disorder. So at the end, by the time you take everything out that you can include from a research perspective um, in your sample, I had 11 in each group. Um, and that's very small, but it's hard to match between the different variables between three groups. Um, so at the end of that, I had four children in the Asperger group who um, had a fluency disorder, and I believe it was one had pure cluttering, one had pure stuttering, and two had cluttering stuttering. Uh, uh, okay, and then uh, and then had atypical dysfluencies. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, say that again. Seven had atypical dysfluencies. Okay, and then atypical atypical dysfluencies means not cluttering, not stuttering, so, um, some other dysfluency. Right, it's more like it, it's kind of like stuttering because you repeat 
but it's at the ends of words, words like this is, as opposed to at the start where most people who stutter would experience that. And and so so the atypical disfluencies were more common than either cluttering or stuttering. Is that what you in found? that in my sample? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so that was in Louisiana, right? Yeah. And um, um, Louisiana is one of my favorite um, places. Um, well, um, I love I, I love the comic book Swamp Thing, and it was um, it's um, the setting is home of Louisiana. So, so once oh, I took a vacation um, to go to um, to go to Louisiana just just to um, find the town of um, the Swamp Thing is supposed to be from. Oh um, wow! I wonder if we were there at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so, 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 why did why did you pick Louisiana? Because that's a little bit far far from home and much much <laughs> different um, um, culture and climate and everything. That was also just a whirlwind. Um, you know, John Tetnowski at that time that listservs were really big, and there was a fluency listserv, and there were some opportunities for funding for doctoral students and. I kind of thought, I don't know if I would want to pursue this, but hey, let me just, you know, ask about it. And, you know, my husband and I were talking about how um, nah, we're not going to move to Louisiana, you know, we're, we're kind of set here and where would he work? And, um, and then before you knew it, within a month or so, I was interviewing there and we decided that we did it. He's an amazing supporter. He stayed here and I lived there and I, we just, you know, commuted back and forth for, uh, three and a half years. <laughs> well, that's, so, um, that's, uh, uh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so, so, so moving on to the, um, you, um, you wanted to talk about like experiences of, of um, folks with, with cluttering and like, um, like from, like from their, uh, from their perspective. Um, let me just open it up to um, what, um, what you'd like to talk about. I guess I just really am so thankful that, that you're getting the word out there about cluttering and you have been for a very, very long time. You're the first person I know. Um, you and Peter Casagalis um, were probably the first two people that I was aware of who really would talk about the experiences of cluttering. And I just feel like it's important for people to understand, you know, people have come to an understanding that stuttering can have some negative impacts, um, but they don't, the old perception of cluttering is that, oh, everybody who clutters is oblivious of their fluency disorder. So they have no idea. So it doesn't bother them. But, you know, I worked with lots of clients where in different ways, it does bother them. Of course, everyone's different in terms of the impact, but I just um, want people to understand that there can be an impact. There's so many things that I feel like our field has grown and understands about stuttering, but they, they have a ways to go to understand the same things about cluttering. Like a lot of um, people who ask me about cluttering will say, well, I don't think this client clutters because you know I talked to them for an hour and they didn't clutter. But yet we know if you talk to someone for an hour and they don't stutter and they tell you that they're having trouble, you, you take that at face value. But I feel like people have all these misperceptions about cluttering, like the minute somebody opens their mouth, they're going to clutter and it's not always the case. So like there's lots of myths that I feel like yeah. I'd like to clear up. Yeah, and um, and that's uh, that that's really interesting for me for me too. And then especially like like it was really hard starting to do videos about cluttering right. because I thought, oh well, I I probably should like I probably should like be doing cluttering while I'm making these videos. Otherwise, it's not really a great example of cluttering. But then like I um, uh, and um, anyway, it was just this thing that like this mental thing that I had to um, go, um, go through and. And like, like say, oh well, do I do I pretend to do I pretend my speech is worse than it actually is just to make the point? And uh, so, so anyway, I, um, I, 
I just settled on, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be whoever I am and try. And my like video speech was, which is a lot better than my normal speech. Right. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's a really, really fascinating, uh, uh, that's a really, really fascinating thing. Yeah, I hope people, I hope people can get that, that, you know, just, you don't always, I don't know, I, I even feel like conferences, sometimes we've had clients come up and talk and they're like, oh, I couldn't tell he cluttered, I couldn't tell he stuttered. I'm like, but listen to the rest of the message. Like, you don't have to be looking for the characteristics, you know, just listen to the rest of their experience with cluttering or stuttering, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and then I think uh, um, something I was thinking about today is that I think that like if you stutter once, then you basically have stuttering uh, because and, and and not necessarily um, not necessarily like a one strike you're out kind of thing, but um, but like if if you have that experience of stuttering, which which like 99 percent of the general populace has never actually stuttered before, um, but if you um, if you actually have that experience of stuttering, then, um, then, um, th um, then you're pretty much, uh, then you're pretty much able, able to be um, diagnosed with, with, uh, with stuttering. And, and it's not that it's, um, it's not that people um, just stutter once, but, um, but, um, but just like, like with cluttering, I think it, it's just not, um, the awareness isn't, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not really making my point very well. Uh, um, um, but ba um, but basically, I think um, I think with stuttering, then someone can say, "Hey, well, I hey, well, I stutter, and I um, and and I'm a covert stutter, and um, and I I never say these words, and I always do this, and and and, and right. it's pretty easy to get a get a diagnosis. Where with cluttering, because most of the disfluencies are normal disfluencies, then it's really, really tough to say, hey, well, does this person actually have cluttering or do they not, um, right. do they not have cluttering? So, so anyway, that's, uh, that's my point. Sorry for rambling on. No, no, I think you're, I feel like you're in agreement with me for people to realize like even in the LCD definition of cluttering, it doesn't have to happen all the time or a majority of the time. And we know that was stuttering too. Even if somebody's not hiding it, Maybe they just don't happen to stutter when you talk to them. That doesn't negate the fact that they have stuttering. And I feel like it's the same, or, or I mean, I know it's the same for cluttering. I just, I, I want people to understand that, that just because you don't see it at that moment doesn't mean it's not there, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that's a, uh, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good point. Um, that, um, that's something that's a little bit frustrating for me is when I talk to someone about cluttering and then they say, oh, no, no, your, um, your speech is fine. You just need to like work on your self-esteem or, 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 or something else. And, th and, and that's mostly just because, well, well, I'm not really, I'm not really sure why like everyone has like different, right. um, different reactions. But I think that, um, I think that basically that if we raise the level of awareness of cluttering with everyone, then um, then it becomes um, uh, th uh, then 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 there are just a whole bunch more productive conversations. Yeah. So and and I think that's um, I think that's interesting that li like a lot of my passion for talking about cluttering is just because nobody really knows about it and and that's something that I really like I, I really like doing um, like like with my job and with other stuff is when uh, when I see something that's kind of complex and complicated and that other people don't understand and that it really shouldn't be that hard to describe but then I always try to figure out how do I um, how do I make this more easy and accessible and so so that's one of the things that really um, drew me to like talking about cluttering is is just that there wasn't really much out there uh, like like I think if um, I think if cluttering were the same as stuttering and they're like seven Seven thousand books on on cluttering, like there are on stutter, like there is yeah. on stuttering. Then, then my, my motivation for talking about my experience a lot probably would be pretty uh, pretty low. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's why uh, uh, that's why I have like a lot of a lot of passion for for that. I think I might be the same. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I do often think even when I get questions from therapists, sometimes like I'll say, okay, just look at this, this, and this, and 
and they keep trying to almost make it more complicated than it is, you know? So I, I, I never thought about it, but I may kind of share that. That's why I'm so passionate about it. I want people to understand what it is. Cool. And, and I saw, um, uh, before, uh, before our, um, interview, I, um, I saw a channel 16, um, news article or, or an, an, a news video, um, on, um, on, on you and the, and the university and the university speech, um, center. And, and that was a, like a really, really cool, um, uh, news article, um, gave me, gave me the warm feelings all over, um, <laughs> um because, uh, because there's this, this cute little girl and she, yeah. um, and she, and she meets with, she meets with you and then her mom says, oh, I, I'm not really sure what Kathy did, but, but whatever she did is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that girl is so eloquent too. She's going places. <laughs> cool. Um, so, um, so, 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 could you um, um, could you talk about that a little bit? And and is that like a um, typical of, of people that you um, that, that you see with cluttering? And um, do you mean kind of the the response to it? Um, yeah. The yeah. Therapy? Yeah. Or, or, or actually, um, actually uh, most most of the people wouldn't have seen wouldn't have seen the video. Um, could, um, could you could you give a little bit of background on? Um, on on her story and then and then what happened and then um, compare that to like how is that typical or atypical? Sure. Um, so when I was at Misericordia University, it was that um, summer we were coming off of the um, uh, World Fluency Congress in Japan, and um, our marketing person got word of that and he's always looking for good local stories. So he, you know, had fed that to someone who does like a local health watch show and said, you know, I, I think you might want to, you know, talk to Dr. Scott about cluttering. And, you know, this is something people don't know a lot about. I was so excited and so grateful for cluttering to, you know, have that, um, you know, even a little bit of promotion. And, that girl, the way that we worked at the university clinic was that um, that's a student model. So students in training to be speech pathologists will work with the clients and then they have a supervisor and then I'm kind of like a, a consultant. So I help set up the sessions. I didn't necessarily work directly with her. Um, the students work directly through me, like through my supervision and guidance. Um, and she was amazing, but I, I take a very pragmatic approach to treating cluttering. So the idea, um, you know, that somebody may be going more slowly may help them to adjust their rate, but to tell somebody to slow down is not to me very functional. So I teach them more about, you know, pausing, putting natural pauses in that we all do because um, for most people who clutter or maybe a lot of them, I guess I really can't say all, right? Um, but many people don't put as many pauses as your average speaker. So teaching them to put natural pauses. And because of that news story, we got referrals of two clients in the community, adults who were coming to therapy much older. And I, I taught them you know, similar things through students. And um, when I first chatted with both of them, I think they were extremely skeptical that they were coming to this much later in life. And there really wasn't, they should have had therapy earlier and there wasn't a lot that could be done. And both of them independent of each other said, wow, you know, it's amazing some of these simple changes, how big of a difference they're making for me. So it's cool to see. Cool, that's, uh, um, that's awesome. So. Um, so, so do you know what, uh, what what the changes were that made the big difference with them? So for um, like for that girl who was in the video, a lot of the difference was putting in natural pauses because um, she didn't do that a lot. And then emphasizing her sounds because sometimes her sounds would kind of like, you know, collapse together. So those were probably the main things. And by the time she was in that video, she was almost done. Um, and more, she was like on kind of a maintenance, like making sure she looked out for when she got feedback from her listener that they didn't understand her, um, trying to use more pauses versus filler words so that she um, had more time 
to formulate her thoughts. And then with one of the other clients, he benefited the most from the pot, the same similar strategies. He had kind of a similar pattern of cluttering. And then the other client had some of that, but more of his was um, the syntactic cluttering where having trouble like formulating thoughts and organizing. And he was always kind of like going down rabbit holes and, you know, going into more detail than he, um, you know, really needed to, to be clear and concise for the speaker. And he spoke for a living too. So he was kind of frustrated. He wanted to be able to be more concise. So we worked on more organizing his ideas and how could he pick out the most important things to say. Huh. Yeah. And that's, um, um, for me, that's really, um, uh, really tough to, uh, figure, uh, figure out, especially when just I have a whole bunch of stuff in my, in my head and, um, and, and I don't really like have a good way to prioritize, say this, then say this, and this isn't, this isn't important. Um, I remember, um, I remember about like five, um, uh, five or 10 years ago, just like having a really, really hard time of like, like kind of like seeing like, this is, um, uh, th th this is the thing that I need to say, um, and um, but but my points over here and like trying to um, trying to balance that. I think I'm I think I'm a little bit better now um, right. because I right. um, uh, um, because I don't have that like overwhelming like hey Joseph say this um, in your um, in my head. Um, but um, but yeah, it's um, it's 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 really uh, that that description is really really interesting. Did you find anything in particular that helped you reduce that? Because I know you've um, done a lot of stuff on your own. Yeah. So, so, so one of the, um, one of the things, um, one of the things that I think kind of, um, might, might seem counterintuitive, but I kind of gave myself license to actually like say everything. Um, so, so I, um, I took a, uh, on my trip to Louisiana, um, I, I, um, I actually took like two and a half weeks and I, I I wrote a blog I wrote a blog post every every day, and um, I what I did is I said okay well I'm I'm gonna write like my style like like um, the teacher um, like my teachers always said um, write a write a introduction sentence write like three right. supporting points write a right. uh, write a conclusion uh, um, so so that's that's like what you're supposed to do. And I right. thought, well, uh, I, I'm just going to throw that out the window, and I'm going to write whatever my style is. Like, like I'm going to figure out what my style is, um, and 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 I also um, I also decided that I would take a I would take a picture, and and I kind of realized that what my style is is that I like to think really really deeply about stuff, and so I'll often like zoom in, like zero in on one yeah. thing, and, yeah. and and think a whole bunch of stuff about it. Yeah. And so, and, and so every, um, every day for like, um, two and a half weeks. So what's that like, um, 18, 18 days or whatever. I, um, I, I, I wrote about like a thousand, 2000 words of usually like just like one experience and like, uh, li like one experience that probably only took about 10 seconds to have that experience. But like all of my thoughts, um, all of my thoughts, um, uh, that, that usually come out all scrambled, um, I put um, I put down in the way that kind of I see the world, and I felt really like comfortable with, and made a like interesting kind of fun story about my about my travel. Um, I, I went from California to uh, Florida was my wow. was my trip, so it was kind of a um, so um, so so anyway um, that um, that was kind of the first part of like de unravel de all of the stuff. Um, in there, um, wow. I um, I learned um, I, I also learned a lot from um, from from reading like public speaking um, books and yeah. and um, yeah. one uh, one technique that I've talked about a lot is is outlining um, right. that, that I that I actually got from one of my friends, right. um, and and she said that when uh, when someone asks her a question, then she usually thinks of three points. Um, like, like she stops, um, she's thinking and, and she has like three points. Right. And, and um, and then, and, and then when she starts talking, she just orderly goes, um, point one, point two, and point three. And then the, 
answer is finished. So, so when I uh, when I first realized that, I was like, whoa, that's like way way different than whatever it is that I'm doing. But but it does seem like it would be really um, beneficial for fluid speech. So I use so, a uh, similar approach to that with my clients, but I'm always interested in like the perspective of. You know, as I said, we learn so much from people who stutter. A lot of times people do things intuitively that help them. So like, I always like to know more from the experiences of like things that you have found that help you too. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, yeah. I have, um, I, have um, I have a lot and it's hard to, like, like, like it's hard to, yeah. uh, it's hard to like think, um, think, think through them uh, right now. Oh, so, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, is autism since you've done a lot of, Okay. Uh, um, since you've done a lot of work with autism and um, and speech disorders, and um, and actually that's why uh, that's why I stopped um, contributing to cluttering is uh, um, back uh, back when I was doing the Yahoo group. Then I, I I'd written a few posts, kind of because um, a lot of my posts have like theories about like why am I this way why um, uh, why is right. my speech uh, right. why is my speech not fluid but, but other right. people's speech fluid and I, I started developing this this theory about like a personality of cluttering um, um, like that uh, like the people with cluttering have this like kind of set personality uh, right. uh, that was my theory back uh, back then and then um, and then I realized that um, all the stuff that I was calling the personality of cluttering was actually autism, and oh. that I um, and, and that I have I have autism. Um, I'm self-diagnosed, um, but um, and, and, and and like formerly like Asperger's um, syndrome, and yeah. um, and um, and so and so when I uh, when I realized that I just um, like like I thought oh um, like. I, I, I thought I knew all this stuff. I thought I was developing this really cool theory about the personality of, of cluttering, but it turns out that like all this stuff that I thought was cluttering personality is more, um, it, it, it is more autism and it, and it just kind of like threw me for a loop and I, and I, um, I, I just took a, um, took a long time to think, okay, well, what about me is cluttering? What about me is autism? Right. And, um, and, and um, and um, and that kind of thing. So um, so so anyway, I'm 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 totally fascinated that you're um, you're an expert of both um, cluttering and um, and autism. Um, so um, so um, so so anyway, um, since um, in the um, in the years that I took off, then I um, then I then at first I came or um, then I came to terms with it. Like like at first uh, at first like I remember reading the Wikipedia article about um, autism. Okay. Um, um, back um, back a long time ago, and I was like, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. Um, and then uh, and then just some stuff happened, and I I realized, oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I have um, I have autism, and um, and and then um, and, and then like I said, um, uh, like uh, like I said, it just kind of threw me that what I was what I was thinking was this cluttering personality was actually uh, autism, and um, it's interesting because. Um, you can have uh, uh, you can have autism without cluttering, and then you can right. have um, uh, and and a lot of people with autism are very very fluid speakers that never actually have disfluencies, right. um, especially the especially some of the like ultra confident like in your face um, folks with uh, folks with autism that just like do 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 do. Right. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so, uh, um, so, so anyway, um, could you, um, could you talk a little bit about that, like, um, cluttering and, and autism and your work on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, yeah, thank you for raising that point. If you didn't, I was going to, so, you know, people know that you don't, um, you know, if you have autism, it doesn't mean you have cluttering. If you have cluttering, it doesn't mean you have autism, but the two can go together. Um, that's the thing that I think, um, really, as a researcher, I developed more, you know, like it resonated with me, um, the, the LCD definition, the lowest common denominator definition of cluttering, because I, I completely appreciate all of the contributions that Dezo Weiss made to the field, absolutely, positively. But 
the things about like the cluttering kind of personality, you know, I always felt uncomfortable with that. Um, and then also just the, the definition of cluttering was so big that a lot of people, uh, like when you looked at some of the earlier criteria, it was like social things and um, it didn't just look at the speech, right? So it was hard for therapists to separate out is this autism or is it cluttering? And now like you made the, the point, like there's characteristics of autism, but there's also characteristics of cluttering. So when I evaluate someone, whether they have autism or whatever, if they have any other diagnosis, a learning disability, I kind of put that all aside and just look at the speech characteristics to see if they meet that definition of cluttering. And then, you know, you can work with all the other pieces. Um, but I don't know if that's completely answering the information that you want about both. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and actually, so, so I know, um, um, I know that you can, um, so, 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 so the thing that I said about, um, you can have, um, you can have autism with cluttering and then you can have autism without cluttering. Um, one uh, one question that I have is, can you have cluttering without autism? I think so. Yeah, definitely. I've worked with lots of clients who I don't, although like as a speech pathologist, we're not really supposed to make the diagnosis in isolation. <laughs> oh, we're oh, supposed oh. to do it on a team. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, but, oh, oh, yeah, that, um, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm, I, I'm trying to only ask like nice questions and, and uh, with you. <laughs> Uh, uh, with you, uh, with, with you letting me know, hey, hey, Joseph, that's a trap question. Um, I, um, I could, I, I could get debarred for um, even, even responding no. to that question. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Uh, but I just want you to know that, just so that you, like, you know, you and other people know that as therapists, we're we're not supposed to make that diagnosis. But I could definitely say, like, I've worked with lots of people with autism, and I. Um, you know, I've worked with lots of people who clutter and there are people who clutter I've worked with and I would not, you know, in my mind, even if you can't diagnose in your mind, you might think, well, this person has characteristics of autism because you know what the characteristics are and they don't, you know, so I don't think you have to have autism if you clutter. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, um, that, um, that, um, that does. And, um, and, and um, anyway, that's, um, so, so I've I've kind of got my own definitions like uh, like, yeah. like 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 there's the official definitions of uh, there's a the official definitions of cluttering and, and I think there are like four or five different official definitions of cluttering uh, but 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 I have like my own definition in my in my head and so like like if I if I see someone I would say oh well this uh, this person fits my definition of cluttering uh, and, and I'm not a um, I'm not a I'm not a professor or anything so, right, so I, right. I I kind of have that liberty where uh, where you can't yeah. be like oh yeah this um, this person has cluttering that person no this uh, uh, but but anyway that's kind of uh, that's kind of my uh, my experience with my uh, with, with my definition oh and, and one of my uh, uh, what one of the one of the parts of my definition is uh, and, and this is more like a test that like almost no one with cluttering or uh, almost no one that doesn't have cluttering does is repeat the same word four times or more. Hmm. So um, so so pretty much uh, pretty much uh, pretty much always um, everybody repeats a word twice in a row. And and I remember um, I, I I watch David Letterman a lot because his speech is really really fluent. And um, and and I noticed that. Part of his, um, part of what he's doing, is, part of what he does is, is the way that he in, introduces a question, especially when he's interrupting someone, is he says the first word of the question and then he repeats it. So he says, "What, what did you do today?" Um, and and that's um, that's very very calculated because he's like his speech is one of the best in the um, in the world, right. um, and right. and so he's like repeating on um, kind of on purpose. If, um, if if it didn't serve a point, then he would have. Um, um, got rid of that. So, uh, so, so anyway, that's uh, that's where I kind of came up with the the theory because because I noticed that he repeats a lot of stuff, but he never ever repeats anything more than twice. Wow. And um, and and then I noticed that um, that that like regular um, regular people with regular speech often repeat some stuff twice and then occasionally three times, but someone without cluttering never says I I I I. I um, like, like they never, 
uh, like someone without cluttering never just keeps repeating the same word over and over right, again, uh, right. four, four times or more, um, sometimes three times, but never, uh, uh, almost never four times. Right. So, so anyway, um, I, that's something that I'm always listening for. And then whenever I hear someone say, I, 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 I'm like, ah, um, now, now I need to listen for other signs because, because, uh, <laughs> um, because uh, that guy just, um, just has a giant check mark on my list of um, <laughs> cluttering, um, cluttering stuff. So, uh, um, so, um, so, so anyway, but, but I understand that, that because you're a professor, you have to be like a lot more um, measured and, and, and can't, can't go around with like haphazard um, um, test, tests like that. Well, it's mostly what, like I had said to you, I went back for my doctorate to learn how to do good, well-controlled research. It's more that I, I think it's from my research brain that I try to keep everything more controlled and keep the confounding variables out if possible. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so kind of, um, kind of going back to autism, I've, I've noticed that um, a lot of my friends with autism that, uh, that, that speak very, very fluidly, they still don't have like typical speech. Um, and, um, and, and and so I'm wondering if you've um, have you um, ha have you analyzed that or thought very much about that about folks with autism with uh, that 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 just kind of um, sound funny, um, but but like everything about their speech is um, for like any way you you would like think to analyze it would be normal. So more just like you're saying, they might be fluent, but then um, it might be more the prosody kind of. Is that what you mean? Kind of where? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Like, um, like, uh, like, like a little kid talking about dinosaurs and um, and and just kind of going on and on and on. Uh, very, 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 very fluid. No, um, no interjections. No, no revisions. Um, right. But, uh, but, uh, but, but kind of a like, like like the same, um, the same kind of, um, kind of underlying cadence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely have thought about it. I think we don't know enough. I think we don't have enough research. When I used to do, you know, a lot of clinical work with it, I would go to conferences on voice and just ask, what can I do to help the prosody of clients with autism? And no one really knew. And I, quite honestly, I don't know how much it's evolved since then. Um, I've worked with a couple of clients who want to work on that. And we've done things like reading plays and doing things um, more from, there's this, this method um, in reading. It's for kids who, you know, when first graders sound out all the uh, words like uh -huh. that, the normal readers, you know, they're not fluent readers yet. So there's something called echo reading where you read, I think it, there might actually be a more official term for it, neuro, neurological impress or something, but it's more that you are, you're reading as the adult who's a fluent reader and they're reading a little bit behind you. So I always explain it to my students as you know how like, you know a song and when it's on, you know all the words, you can sing along, but when you sing it by yourself, you don't know all the words, you kind of mm -hmm. need a little boost of the song. So um, I've done things like that with inflection and things to help some of my clients who've wanted to work on that melody of their speech, but I really, I, I have not seen anything really evolve in terms of how else to work on it, you know, if possible to change it for yeah, those people yeah. who want to you know and um and that's something that um uh, like like one of the uh one of the kind of depressing things for me in in speech therapy um was uh, w w when i was diagnosed they had this like giant machine uh, w uh, which uh, w which now like there are like seven thousand apps that can do the same um thing but there was this giant like pitch machine and i was supposed to uh, like like it, it it gave a pitch and i was supposed to like yeah, say, yeah. Um, was supposed to say the same pitch and uh, like, like I could, uh, with a lot of the activities when they were diagnos diagnosing me, I didn't know, um, I didn't know like if it was, um, like if I was doing a good job or not, but, but with a pitch machine, I knew um, I was totally failing um, at, um, at this um, because, 
uh, um, because just like at that point, I had no way of of like controlling my pitch at all, right. and um, and that's something uh, that's something that like I think just didn't come natural to me is like being able to change my pitch or being able to change the loudness of my voice or right. being able to change um, how fast or how slow that I say stuff. Um, right. now, now, I, now I'm much better. And like, if you told me, hey, well, um, talk, talk high, talk low, talk, talk fast, talk slow, talk, um, talk whatever, then, um, th then I could do a much better job than I did before. Right. Um, but, but back then when I started speech therapy, I had zero, um, zero skills as far as like, like if you said, hey, well, say, say that, um, say that like 10% louder than you said it before, then um, just, I, um, I didn't have that skill to be able to um, say something louder or softer. And some kids, like, they also struggle with something, I don't know if you've heard about apraxia of speech, but it's more motor planning. And some people who have autism may also have, a lot of times it's more prevalent in young childhood. Some people believe it goes away and gets resolved. Some people believe it never really gets resolved. It just morphs into different forms. But um, it has to do more with motor planning. And this one young man who I worked with, he really wanted to increase his inflection. You could see it was such an effort for him. Like he loved Spider-Man. And I said, you know, it, the summer I worked with him, I think the Spider-Man, one of the Spider-Man movies came out. And I said, what'd you, what'd you think of the movie? And he was like, it was good. And his mom's like, no, tell her how you really feel about it. <laughs> but he couldn't, like even when we worked on things, you could see how hard it was for him to get that expression to come through. And so I've always wondered about like, is there, for some people, is there a motor planning component? Huh. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's um, like, like that's, that's really interesting and really cool to hear you say that because like most of the people that I, uh, or uh, most of the people that I try and describe that, oh yeah, it's really tough for me to um, to do that. They're like, um, that's weird. Just like talk louder, talk quieter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, just um, just do it. But 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 like whatever whatever it is about me that that, that wasn't like a natural skill that I yeah, um, that yeah. I developed. So uh, um, so so anyway, it's it, it's really cool that you you totally get that it's really really tough. Um, and, and, and didn't actually like come natural to me. Right. And I mean, we, we do know like, right. From imaging that the brains of people with autism are, are different. So it kind of stands to reason that things are different. And I think people always make simple explanations for complex problems. Right. <laughs> <laughs> People tell me to have better posture and stand up straighter all the time. And they tell me I just have to work at it and I just have to try, but it's very difficult. And one day I had an occupational therapist who said to me, of course you can't. She said, you're very low tone up here. And this is why, like she gave like a more logical explanation, like versus, well, if you just tried harder, you know? <laughs> So, I mean, we all, like other people are not thinking as hard about the melody of their speech, right? It's just uh -huh. a, so, so to me, it makes sense that if it's, if it's not happening, there must be a reason why, not just because you don't care and, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so um, one of the, one of, uh, one of my questions is um, how come, how come your books are all so expensive? Uh, because um, <laughs> um, uh, um, because I think I, I think the cheapest the cheapest of your three books is fifty dollars on Amazon, and then um, um, this one I think was like sixty or seventy, and then your other one is is also like sixty or seventy, right? I mean, I will tell you that I don't have any control over that. So, you know, over the years, I've been wondering about like self publishing, and I have no idea how that works. I know that like textbooks in general as a professor are just getting exorbitantly expensive. And this one, the one that you're showing like in 2009, David and I um, published that. And I don't know the publisher sets the rate, but the managing cluttering one that David Ward and I did this one, uh -huh. um, we really, really lobbied like you have to keep this at a reasonable price because there's been research that shows, you know, therapists, and we wanted to get it to therapists, right? 
um, that therapist, like if it hits the $50 point, it's too much, you know, it's either not within the budget of where they work or it's not within their own personal budget. It's not, you know, worth their, um, to them, it's, it's not worth the investment. So the last I looked, this ebook was like, the ebook was 30, but uh, I mean, we, we lobby with them, but we don't really have much say. That's the unfortunate. Uh, uh, okay. And, and, are, and are all, all, are all three of your books, um, text, like classroom textbooks? Um, I mean, like the first one, I think you'd probably say like the, the cluttering one, this one, would probably be most applicable to to the classroom. I mean, of course, anybody could read it, um, you know, but like to more, it's got more of the research stuff, but it does have therapy in it as well. And then the other two books were written that they could be used. I would say this one, the managing cluttering is really, I'm terrible, see, I'm terrible with the visual, <laughs> getting it in the camera. Um, was written really more for a therapist or if people wanted to, you know, kind of do their own therapy because there's an adult section. It was written more for that. And then also um, like in university clinics where I told you like our students are learning to be therapists. I've had colleagues who said, you know, I'm supervising someone and they're treating someone with cluttering and I tell them, take this book home and read it so that you better understand what to do. So it's kind of meant more this one for sure meant more for the therapy and this one was meant the last one that i can't um was meant to be more like kind of a a, a mix of where it could be used in the classroom because it's got a lot of the background on cluttering and stuttering that you could infuse into a course but it could also be used in the clinic to help stu um students treat and it could be used by therapists because there's lots of therapy activities in it too. So. Oh, cool. So, um, so, so how much is Fluency Plus about cluttering? Um, maybe a third. Okay. A third so, cluttering, a third stuttering, a third atypical dysfluency. That's kind of how I tried to build it. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's really cool. So, so what's, um, so you, you mentioned the atypical um, fluency of repeating right. the last syllable of word. Right. Are, are there other a atypical fluencies or, or is that the main, the main one? Um, the other one that we typically see is that people might insert a sound. So they will be talking about something and maybe they'll say, I went, to the store, like there'll be a sound there. Um, and it's not a tick because you don't hear it at other times except when they're speaking. Um, I mean, of course it could be, but I'm saying when you when you determine that it's an atypical dysfluency, then you've kind of ruled that out. Or they might kind of put that sound in the middle of a word. Um, so I'm trying to think, I went, mm, to the store. I'm not doing it well. I just analyzed a big sample of kids with autism where a lot of them did it. Um, but that's where they would kind of insert an extra sound in the word or between words. Huh. That, uh, that, uh, that's interesting. And, and, and with the repeating a syllable at the end of a word, I, I don't think I've ever actually heard anyone do that. Um, is, is it like super uncommon or, I, or am I not, am I just not listening for the right things or, um, or, or what? I think it might be more common than we think, but it's still, in my experience, it's probably less common than cluttering. So, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's like, you have to just have awareness of it and maybe you'll hear it in the future um, because I found many cases where I've I've told people about it and you know a couple of weeks later they're emailing me and going oh I, I just heard that or we've had kids in our clinic where the student treating the client has come to me and said I hear these atypical disfluencies and I said did you ask the parents if they hear them and like one example which happens over and over is that they asked the parent and the parent said, no, no, I never heard that. And then the next week they say, um, yeah, uh, that's all I hear now. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that's really interesting. 
I um, I've I've read about that, so so like I'm I'm familiar with the concept of repeating the last syllable, but but, but yeah, I haven't I haven't heard heard of it. Oh, and um, and 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 back to your book, um, cluttering. I noticed that you dedicated like a whole page of your uh, um, your your like your like chapter chapter nine or chapter fourteen or something, uh, where where you and Ken St. Louis um, 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 collaborated on like cluttering cluttering support groups. Yeah, that was my very first kind of dabble in, as a doctoral student into interviewing people who clutter and getting their experiences. Cool. Well, well, um, so so if I if I'd known that you quoted me in this book, I would have bought it a long, long, uh, long time ago. I quoted you in the book, and <laughs> and I didn't send you a copy. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, uh, that's um, the part about being overloaded and not thinking of things. <laughs> See, that's how that happens. <laughs> so, uh, so, so anyway, thanks, uh, thanks very much for quoting me in the book. It was uh, and um, and saying all those nice things. I, I'm, I now I need to go back to the chapter, but I, I in my heart I feel all those nice things about you, Joseph. I feel like we <laughs> would not understand cluttering, and cluttering would not be where it is today if it weren't for you. Seriously. Well, wow, thanks. That's uh, that's a that's a very very nice thing to say. I so, have, um, yeah. When you, um, I have one thing I did want to ask you about um, your thoughts on at some point, <laughs> <laughs> but it's up to you if you want me to ask you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, please, um, please do ask me. Well, I think that one of the things that's been informative is that. Um, you don't stutter, correct? Yes, correct. And I think sometimes people think, you know, you have that sample out on the internet where people think that you do. They, uh, uh, do you remember that one? It's still there. Um, yeah, yeah. And actually, I um, I don't know if I ever actually said this, but but it's um, that is kind of uh, I kind of had to make um like fabricate that uh, okay okay um yeah. and um i and i think i i, I uh, because um uh, because i like like recording recording myself i right. can't actually get um so 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 what i did is um and, and as i was learning about cluttering i realized oh hey well the thing the thing that is um the thing uh, the thing that like 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 my 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 cluttering is kind of going away, so I I, I need yeah. to um, I need to record record this, and so what uh, what I did is I got um, I tried to get myself in the mind space of when I was having right. like, like right. a breakdown, um, but right. but um, when when I'm actually in that mind space, I'm not um, I I wouldn't be able to be like have, having a conversation. I would be like, like right. kind of right. Um, I, I'd be kind of off. Um, so 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 one of the ways to tell that it was like um 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 simulated was that uh, was that i was still like doggedly trying to make my point um and, yeah. and, and, um where where when i have a breakdown i'm just like uh when i have a breakdown um i'm um i i i just kind of lose it and and like just go go all over the place yeah um, and and so, and, and so basically, I uh, basically I thought, oh, I I need to um, I need to I, I need to like preserve this because uh, whatever it is in inside of myself is going away. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, and so it was. Um, so, so, so I tried. Um, I I I tried to get myself in that um, in that in that space where I was having uh, what I'm calling a, a breakdown, um, and then I um, and then I recorded it. And so, so I think I, I think it's close to my actual. Um, my actual speech at that at that point, but it's not um, it's not actually um, it's not actually a um, um, it's not actually like um, hundred percent real if that yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And so I don't know, yeah, if it's characteristic, but it it kind of start started a conversation and like interesting things happen where you know sometimes, people listen to that and they think they're stuttering in it. And we all say, oh, cluttering and stuttering, like they so often go together, right? But after, you know, I knew that you had said, no, like I don't stutter, you know? So um, 
But over the years, I've had clients who've had these like fleeting moments that almost seem like stuttering blocks. And when I talk to them about it, they're like, that's, I don't experience what a person who stutters experiences. So I'm just telling, I'm just telling you like one of the things in my mind as a researcher is I just wonder if, you know, we say it's so common for the two to to go together, but I wonder if like there's these little tense moments that are part of cluttering and they're not stuttering. Oh yeah, yeah, and and uh, that's a um, that's that's really interesting because yeah, I I think from that speech sample then then I was doing a lot more of like I I I I, I, I uh, like um, maybe maybe yeah. Uh, uh, um, so, and and then especially in in, uh, in between um, in between words and I I was um, I was I was doing that at at one point like now um, now I don't really do that uh, right. now I don't really do that but but if you would have like fast backwarded in in time and and I would have had like if I was saying the word I and I I got stuck on it and 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 I and I and I made a lot of like stuttering like sounds with the word I. And then, um, it, um, and then you, uh, um, and then I calmed down, and you said, "Okay, say the word I." Then I would be able to say "I" and, uh, without like any, uh, without like any stuttering component. And so, so I think um, like like when I when I when I when I when I first started learning about cluttering, um, like um, like on my own, and I read about like stuttering stuttering versus cluttering, and and how people with right. cluttering also have a stuttering component. Right. Then, um, th- then what I did is I kind of went through and 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 like kind of analyzed my speech for stuttering, and and I think I think what happened is that I, um, I I found a couple of sounds that I would repeat on, and um, but uh, but then uh, but then it, like after I got awareness of them, then I was able to like work out that right. stuttering component within like a within like a couple of weeks. Um, and, and and so I I don't think that's really stuttering because I've never right. heard um, I've never heard of someone saying okay well n- now I'm aware right. of them repeating right. this uh, um, right. so 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 even though um, even though I was basically like um, for, from my perspective stuttering um, the uh, uh, b- because I was able to cure myself in two weeks that's not that's definitely not stuttering so 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 I think I, I think what it probably was is just like extreme cluttering that. Um, that sounded like so much like stuttering that it even sounded like stuttering to myself. It just really kind of opened my thinking and then having clients over the years. I'm not saying people can't have both. There are definitely people who have both the cluttering and stuttering, but I just really wonder about some of those things. If we kind of like our ear goes, oh, that's stuttering, but maybe it's not really stuttering. It's something a little different, you know, and unique to cluttering. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know you know Rutger Wilhelm, Wilhelm right? Yeah, 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 um, yes. Yeah. So, um, so he, he's he's just published his book that uh, that, yeah. that talks about his experience of of being misdiagnosed as someone with stuttering yeah. and then realizing, oh yeah, that's um, that, that's not me. And and actually, I I remember um, I remember I, I worked in a factory right after high school, um, and this guy uh, this guy at the factory. He 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 had stuttering, and and I remember like really liking the way that he spoke, hmm. and and I remember like trying um, trying some stuff, uh, or, or like like trying to repeat some words like 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 That's he did, and um, and and I remember it like like I remember. Um, I remember like using using that model of stuttering kind of helped me to speak more and, huh. and um, I don't know um, I don't know if you know this about me but I I just didn't speak at all when I was a uh, when I was a kid oh wow uh, um, like, uh, like like just um, just like just a few a few words a, a month kind of um, kind of kind of speaking you were what they call a late talker like were you one of those uh, um, no, uh, no no i think um, like i think i talk I, I think i talked normally and then like when I, when i went to uh, when i went to school then i just kind of like didn't say anything for um wow like like i was always the quiet one in the in the class and 
um, because like, of your of, speech or no? Um, no, um, no, no, I don't, um, I don't really, I, I don't really think so. And I don't really like know very much about, uh, about it. Well, yeah. well um, probably, um, probably because of my speech, because I, I remember, um, I remember just like not being able to like get from my head to like being able to speak, but, I, but, but I didn't actually like attribute it to um, speaking and, and didn't really, uh, right. um, yeah, yeah. So, So, um, so yeah, that, uh, that, uh, that was a long time ago, and I'm not really, yeah. I'm not really very, very sure. But, uh, um, but, but, but yeah, I, um, I didn't really like know. Um, I, I didn't really know how to like have a conversation or how to like um, put together like a oh, yeah. paragraph. Uh, uh, put put together like a paragraph of speech. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, but I just wanted your take on that whole stuttering piece because. I just feel like I know you're somebody through the work that you've done that you do think very deeply about things. So, <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah, and um, and I um, and, and I'm also fascinated with uh, with with stuttering too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, like um, like like I was telling you earlier about like smart people that are like very very different personality types than me. I'm I'm always like trying to figure out like what's uh, what makes uh, what makes this person tick. What's um, like why are they so good at what they're uh, what uh, what they're good at and um and like i've um i i would i would guess that um uh, i would guess that your your theory is right that um that stuttering cluttering um hybrids are very very rare i just i just really wonder if they're not as common as we think and that some of those characteristics that we think are stuttering or maybe something unique to cluttering. It's just something I've been pondering and trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's um, so. So my um, my, uh, uh, my definition of, of stuttering is um, is about it, it is all, all centers around. And I know this um, this isn't actually a um, the, the the like official definition, but. But but it's all about the inability to reliably produce a sound, um, like to move and, forward. Like you know the word you want to say, but you can't move forward with it, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so um, and so and so and so just so, something about you like stops on a sound, or or like um, j just it, you're you're just physically not able to produce the right. sound. Um, right. And so. Um, and so, so basically, then I would say everything. Um, the cluttering is everything that isn't. Uh, or, or, um, cluttering is everything that isn't that. And so, so if you have someone that, um, if you have someone that can produce every sound, and and like you, you think of a word, uh, you think of a word, and then that person can say that word, um, then um, uh, th then I would say that they don't um, have a stuttering component. And then, and, um, and then vice versa with uh, uh, with cluttering uh, with cluttering then. Um, or, 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 or wait, I, I, um, I think I messed up on what I was saying, but uh, like cluttering versus stuttering, but, um, but I, I don't know if, I don't know if my, you may. I think I was following you, so I might <laughs> just. Yeah, <okay. laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, so, so it's a good, um, it's a good theory and, and like, um, yeah, and, um, and like with, um, and like with me, like when, when my speech was at its worst, um, I think that probably I, um, I I was probably lucky getting diagnosed with with cluttering instead of like um, seven um, seventeen other um, other things that I could have been diagnosed with because um, because my uh, uh, because my speech was just really really bad at that point. Oh, um, so so one of the uh, one of the things that I that I uh, I saw on your um, profile was about um, that, that you've done research in working memory. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I did some stuff. I still wonder about that, right? Um, it, when you're telling a story, and a lot of my clients have said, you know, they're telling a story. Part of the reason that some of them say they have to tell all these details or they have to speak quickly is because they feel like they're going to forget, 
what they're going to say. So it's always made me wonder if there's some component to working memory issues. I haven't found it consistently um, and I mostly looked at it in kids, but I mm -hmm. feel like it's somehow a piece of this because it's the whole idea of having to, you know, keep thoughts in your mind as you're explaining them and kind of keep your eye on what's the big picture and what are the main details. And um, so I, I definitely think there's something in it. Maybe it's not universal to everyone who clutters. I also think it, it may play a role in the atypical disfluencies as well. Um, I had someone tell me yesterday, their daughter with the atypical disfluencies, she just said she just has so much to say in such a small space. And based on the characteristics that she described to me, I wonder if she clutters, she's little, so not sure, but she definitely had the, you know, repeating the ends of words, erds, and I just wonder if like, um, almost working memory is not big enough for the amount of information that the person is trying to express. You know, like maybe working memory is average, but it's, it's, not, it's not enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, and and um, I've always been I've always been fascinated with that in um, in in Deso Weiss's book. Then he, um, he he has a working memory test. I don't know if you remember uh, that, but but he but he says uh, what what you do is you start uh, you have the you have the person start with the number one hundred and right. then count backward, count backwards by threes. So one hundred ninety seven ninety four and then um, and then go back um, go to like whatever um, go to zero. Uh, and and I, I thought oh this uh, this is easy I, I graduated in math I love math it's a it's a super easy right. math problem so um, so so I was, so I just stopped 197 94 right. um, and then uh, and then about um, and, and then about like 20 because um, I know enough in math that I and whenever like a lot of my job is like doing like complex um, complex math that other people can't right. figure out. So, right. so around twenty, uh, around twenty, like my, uh, like my mind is doing the cross calculations, and and around twenty, I realized, oh, I I messed this up somewhere, um, <laughs> um, and 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 it was just super super embarrassing, like like hey, I'm a, I'm a grown man, and I can't I can't do the simple exercise of count backwards count backwards by threes from a hundred to zero, um, right. <laughs> uh, but uh, but 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 his point was about working memory, and so uh, so so after that, I, I I've always been like fascinating uh, fascinated in the uh, with with working memory. I have to go back to that and see. Yeah, and I mean, I think the frustrating thing with research and having small samples because it's hard to get people right with the pure cluttering and. Um, is that I don't think you always get to get a true representation. Like we've seen this a lot in stuttering too, where there's things that we have hunches about and we suspect, and those hunches could be wrong, but sometimes I think we don't have the sophisticated enough tools to prove those. And so that's what I wonder, like, is there something with working memory? Like, I will tell you again, this is a typical disfluency, not um, cluttering, but, um, with a lot of those kids I worked with, they happened to have neuropsychological testing because they had other diagnoses like autism, ADHD. And I would always notice that working memory was a relative weakness. It was average, but it was a relative weakness compared to other cognitive scores. So that's why I wonder like, is the working memory not big enough for what they want to convey? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's uh, uh, that's probably a um, that's probably a really good way of putting it. Um, but uh, that's also that's also complimentary because if uh, because maybe uh, maybe it is that folks with cluttering just want to convey a lot more than the average person. And and if the average person tried to convey all of that too, then their speech would fall apart too. Uh, like like one of the um, uh, one of the ways that I describe like. Uh, I, um, I guess working memory to myself um, is that is that like when I'm speaking, it's kind of like I'm juggling, and yeah. and I um, I imagine that um, I imagine that if I were juggling, that if I like dropped one ball, 
Right. Uh, as soon as one ball dropped, then then they would all drop because I would get out of like rhythm. Um, right. And so, uh, and so especially like, like one of the frustrating things for me about cluttering is when I when, when I start mazing and then um, and then I and then I just like kind of lose everything and it's kind of like it, it's kind of like that I'm uh, that I that I feel like I'm juggling along and then one ball drops and then do 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 like they, um, they, um, right. they all drop on the floor. And and this happened to me. Uh, this happened to me a, um, a lot before, where like I I like like my my whole mind would go blank, and I couldn't think of hey, well, what what was I even talking about? Right, right, yeah. So I wonder. We'll keep looking at that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so 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 I think the um, I think the whole thing with working memory is really is really interesting. So I think um, it, um, it's we're over the hour mark. So so I think um, I, um, I think we should start um, wrapping up. Any um, anything um, anything that you want to add or that we didn't that we didn't talk about that you think would be um, good to add to the video? I mean, I think just like I I love the fact that you're bringing up the working memory because I've always kind of thought that. Um, you know, the executive function type things, those things, self-regulation are a huge part of cluttering. And I think that plays out in the therapy. So that's another thing I just think we should keep our eye on that, you know, maybe we're not talking about when sometimes people are looking at, is there a language problem or not? I don't think it's a true language. I think it might be more organization for many people, so. Mm -hmm things to watch for. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for doing this interview. And thanks so much for all of your work with, uh, with, with cluttering. And it's just, um, it, it, it's really good. Uh, it, um, like, I really like your approach, because, uh, because since you're, um, so, uh, since you're also a clinician, then you also have a very, very human approach to, um, um, to, to everything. And, and, and like, one of the things that was really tough for me, like reading through, uh, uh, reading through Dessa Weiss's book and, and and some other like old historic stuff is they're just like, like to someone with cluttering it's really depressing. Um, yeah. so, so like yeah. I, 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 I'm sure if you're a researcher like oh this is interesting this is interesting but then uh, but but when they're like actually talking about you then uh, um, then it uh, then, then it just uh, like sometimes sometimes I thought uh, I I just like emotionally I have to stop reading this. Yeah, it's just too. Uh, uh, it's just too heavy, and uh, um, and so so the thing I really like about your approach is that it's it, it's just nice and uh, nice and warm and friendly and and I human. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, so so anyway, um, thanks um, thanks very much, and um, yeah, I really really appreciate this. Going.